everybody, and welcome to the world's favorite youth baseball podcast, Clearing the Bases, featuring Coach Jimmy, Phil, and Jerry. I'm David Friedman, and I want to thank you for coming along this ride with us. How are we doing this morning, Coach? We're doing good, Dave. A little cold, a little snow. It, uh, temperature was what here? Uh, 55, 60 degrees yesterday? Yeah, we had about a 30 degree uh, drop down. It's been, uh, it was, I definitely preferred yesterday. I could tell you that. My back preferred not shoveling yesterday as well. <laughs> I woke up this morning and I went out and, you know, everything was blanketed in snow. And I was like, what the hell happened? Yeah, I had no clue that that was coming. So uh, it's, uh, but it's not, not too bad. Not too bad. You know, I'm, I'm starting to feel a little bit like a weatherman. Every time we start the show off, that's what I started with is what the weather is. Yeah. Well, you know, at least it's not the uh, nine degrees that you had in Chicago as the last time we spoke. So, uh, so it's a little better than that. This is true. So, and speaking of a little better than that, as our special guest this week, we have Mr. Jonathan Reinbold. He is a mental performance coach. He is in very sunny Hawaii right now. And uh, he has, his company is Kaizen Mental Performance. He can be reached, uh, you can see his web, his uh, webpage at IamMentallyStrong.com, IamMentallyStrong.com. And I'm very happy to welcome as our guest this week, Jonathan Reinbold. How are you doing tonight, Jonathan? Doing great. I appreciate you having me on. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to have you here. So now uh, you and Jimmy have had a relationship for some time, a uh, working relationship for some time. I don't, I don't think that we've actually met. I know you had done some work with the Cadets Performance Academy. Uh, my kids were there uh, back when that had started up, but I don't think that we had actually met. Um, but so it is very nice to meet you, and I appreciate you coming on with us. Yeah, no problem. And speaking of changes in weather, we, we have a drastic change right now. It's either going to be 79 or 81 for the next week. So ah, poor, <laughs> poor baby. Yeah. I, 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 I wish it was terrible. a little more consistent. <laughs> so why don't you give us a little history on your baseball playing and, and how you evolved into a mental performance coach? Well, um, I was raised in a quote baseball family. My father was a high school baseball coach and also a minor league baseball coach. I played high school baseball and then I went on to West Point, played four years at West Point, And that was basically the end of my career because I wasn't that great. But I had a son who was playing the game and they were, he was in college and they were struggling a little bit. So I just started to read, you know, how different ways that you can work with motivation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that just kind of lit a spark to me. And it just grew and grew and grew. And I got my master's in applied sports psychology from uh, Adam State out in Colorado. And just started practicing on my own, um, working with, I actually put out on ABCA. That's how we met. I put out on ABCA. Anybody want to do this? Because I need the time for, for my master's program. I need the um, actual hours for my master's program. And you volunteered. And I hopefully didn't screw you up too bad. Are you kidding? Everything that that uh, that I've learned from you is priceless. It um, it helps my me and my players out tremendously. And I was always curious when you put that post in the forum on the ABCA um, app. Did you get a lot of people that responded that were interested? I think I had three. Wow. Yeah, and you're the only one that followed up. Wow. Oh, yeah. Jimmy is good like that. If he says he's going to do something, if he's showing interest in it, he's definitely going to follow up on it. So was like, was this part of your thesis? No, it was just practical hours, just practical hours, just okay. practical hours. And plus I figure the only way I'm going to get good at it is practicing it. Just yeah, well, that sounds skill, familiar. Right? <laughs> I think so, you can make, some, you can make some correlations uh, yeah, between so it, that and what we talk about every week. If, if I don't practice what I'm preaching, it's kind of hollow. It's kind of fake and people will pick that up. So I try to practice what I preach. And one of the things is you got to do quality practice. So I, I find that, I find that really, really interesting because again, I, I didn't know that. I assumed that you had, you know, several people that, that might've been interested. So, you know, for everybody listening out there, here you go. Dave and I talk about this many times where we say that teaching our players the mental side of the game is so important yet 
a lot of coaches don't see the importance and they don't see the value in it. So um, I, 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 like I said, that just amazed me. Yeah. And the thing to me is after having done this for about three or four years now, what I see from the players, the biggest thing I see from the players is they enjoy their sport more because they know how to deal with pressure now. And they understand a lot of it is put on by themselves. Yeah. There's other pressure that they have, but you teach them how to control what, you know, identify what they can control and then deal with that. And they end up enjoying the sport so much more. Sure. And I'm sure your, your curriculum with the, the players, obviously that, that you're working with is, is sports focused, but it's got to relate to every other aspect in life as well. Absolutely. It's to me, it's life skills. What I really do. I, I just got done with an internship at West point in their mental performance cell, if you will. Um, and that's the way I would approach the cadets is these are life skills. This is something that you're going to use and can use for the rest of your life. I'll give you a great example. I had a player taught him how, just basic breathing techniques. He wanted to join the army and this is not West point, but this is, he wanted to enlist in the army. He took his test for placement and he didn't score well enough to get a bonus. It's like a $20,000 bonus, not insignificant money, especially for an 18 year old. Right. Sure. And he came back to me after his second test and he goes, coach, I reminded myself just to breathe before the start of the test. And he relaxed enough. He scored well enough. He got his 20 grand bonus just because, you know, he remembered how to breathe, how to, how to control his own physical and mental state. And you benefited from it. So yeah, they are absolutely life skills, something you could use every day of your, every day of your existence. Okay. So let's, let's jump a little bit into it. What is mental performance? What does it mean? To me, what it means is just using things that you do every day for your betterment instead of fighting against them. For example, we all have an imagination. Is that imagination being used for you or is it being used against you? Are you saying, oh, I can't do this because X, Y, or Z? Or are you saying, hey, I got this? You know, if you think about it, when you were a little kid, what did you do? You imagine playing in the World Series game seven, two outs, bases loaded, and you get the base hit, right? That's using your mind for you. Instead of as we, as we get older and life kind of beats us down a little bit, going, okay. Uh, I would strike out there or whatever it is. It's just using your imagination, using your breathing, using your self-talk, which is just a fancy word for how you talk to yourself. Cause we all talk to ourselves. It's just, is it productive or is it counterproductive? So just using all those things to help you instead of hurting your performance or impairing your performance. Okay. So you, you mentioned several times about breathing. Let's talk about that for a little bit. When, or, or let's say what type, of breathing are you teaching your your players and what what is each different type being used for and how do you apply it yeah there's if you want to calm down physically the breath is a great way to do that it also th there is a mind body connection so when you calm yourself down physically you're also calming yourself down mentally or you can at the same time so first thing i would teach them is just how to breathe, which sounds funny, but most people don't know how to breathe productively again, where it works for us. So when we get in a pressure situation, what do most of us do? We either start breathing really fast or we hold our breath. And that's not good. What we want to do is we want to take nice, slow, deep breaths, oxygenates the blood. It calms you down. It, it, there's a bunch of variables that affects. Um, so I just teach them how to breathe. In other words, inhale through the nose, fill up the diaphragm, and then slowly exhale through the nose. And, and that's basically it. That's one way of doing it. And that's quick, easy. Anybody can do that anytime. We do it. Some people do it naturally. Others do not. But that's a great way to do it. Doesn't take a whole lot of skill to do. 
and it's easy. And then we can also get into things like box breathing. Box breathing is you inhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds. Or four, two, six breathing, which is inhale for four seconds, hold for two seconds, exhale for six seconds. If you want to relax more, focus on your exhale. If you want to, if you need to be jazzed up, focus on your inhale. If you see weightlifters, what do they do? Your competitive weightlifters, they take a big inhale before they go and do what they're going to do. So it's just the mind body, mind body link and just different ways that you can slow your body down, slow your mental processes down just through breathing and doesn't take a lot of skill, but the, it is a skill and it needs to be practiced because if you don't practice it, you will forget about it when it comes time to use it and need it. So that go ahead, Dave, you were going to say something. No, I was going to say, because, it, and, and this is stuff where we talked about a little bit ago, where you talk about it's, it's life skills. Cause obviously, you know, you use the example of the, um, the entrant into the army that did it prior to taking a test. And that's, that's where I, I would see it. It's, it's any type of pressure situation that somebody's under. Obviously it sounds like this is something it more than sounds like it. Cause I've done things like this, um, myself, uh, for my own situation. I, I, uh, in addition to doing the coaching and doing the podcast, my regular job, I, I do training and whatnot, and I do seminars and webinars and things like that. So I, I have been in situations where I've been in front of quite a large audience and I never really thought about teaching, trying to teach somebody else doing it. It's just stuff I kind of read up on, on my own and things like that. Very similar to what you're talking about here. The first time I ever heard of box breathing was probably five, six years ago. And I believe it was an interview I was listening to with a Navy SEAL. And I'm thinking like, well, <laughs> he's under just a little bit more pressure than <laughs> I am talking in front of 25 people about mortgages. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think if it works for him, maybe this will work for me. And um, yeah, I found it to be very, su very successful, very easy. Once you get into a groove with it, you know, it's, it's not something that you need to really, um, uh, it, getting prepared to do it is not going to add any extra stress to your life, basically. No. And, and the neat thing about it is because we all know teenagers and we're talking mainly teenagers for your show, right? That's who your, yep. yes. yeah. who your audience for your coaches is, are. It's something they can do. Nobody else can see. Nobody can see your breathing really, unless, unless they're really paying attention. Nobody can see their breathing. So it's something that they can do self-regulate. It's not obvious to everybody. And it works. It works. You just brought up a point too. Um, the Navy SEALs use this. I was, I was a special operations aviator in the army and special operations, the command at McDill four-star command, they now hire mental performance coaches for all of their special operators to teach them these skills. So if you think you need mental, if, if you think that you're, getting coached in mental skills because you're weak mentally is so off base and so wrong. I dare you to go ahead and tell a SF guy or a seal or a PJ <laughs> right. that, that they're not mentally they're strong. Weak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it, it, it is something that, it, that it's just basically learning skills to better yourself. We, we, we use skills. We hone our skills on hitting. We hone our skills on throwing. We, you know, fielding. This is just the mental side because every play you're thinking every play you're using your brain. So why would we not own that part of the game? Right. And like, like I say all the time that the, the game of baseball is, is a bunch of smaller games within the game. So each pitch is actually a game and you're trying to win. You have to prepare for that particular pitch, whether you're on defense or, or you're in the batter's box you know, you, you have to be able to keep yourself. We always say control what you can control. So you can control your breathing. You can control calming yourself down. These are things that'll help you perform better in that particular situation. Yeah. And, and you nailed it on the head. I mean, the only pitch that you can actually affect is the one that you're currently playing. You can't go back and fix the error that you had two winnings ago. You can't go forward to figure out what's going to happen. All you can do is operate in the here and now the present 
to affect your performance. When you're, when you're focusing on the past or the future, what are you not focusing on? What you do right control. Now. Yeah. And, and what it gives you the best chance of winning. See, the mental game is not magic. It's not, you're going to win every time. It's just doing things that give you the best chance to perform your best at that moment. Somebody said that um, the mental game is allowing you to perform your best when it matters the most. Is basically what it is. And, yeah. and you won't perform better than you normally perform ever. You know, the SEALs say that. That's one of their little little axioms is, you know, that you perform to the level of your training. If your training is crap, you're going to perform like crap. If your training is great, you're going to probably perform better. But you're never going to perform better than the way you train. It just doesn't happen. I've heard it put that, um, as a matter of fact, I believe it was probably a quote from a SEAL that said, when in times of pressure, we don't rise to the occasion, we sink to the level of our training. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's true in baseball. You know, it's if, if you and, and this is part of quality practice, and this is part of the mental game. If you never practice where you're failing, where you're pushing your skills to where you fail, then you will never get better. And you will never when the pressure's on. You know, you just won't perform the way you could. I love the way we run batting practice where I am here in Hawaii for the high school team because we challenge the kids all the time. There's no 55 mile an hour fastball over the center of the plate, right? There might be during drill session, but when we take actual BP, we set up the machine so it's throwing hard, change locations, change speeds. We do all that stuff. At first, the kids hate it can't stand it but after a while they understand why and they they actually take a little bit of pride in what they do um because we make it challenging we we and we also encourage failure we don't get on kids for failing which is really right. important yeah they're, they're not seeing a lot of 55 mile an hour fast loss over, over the middle of the plate when they get into the game so that makes i mean it makes all the sense in the world um, unfortunately, a lot of teams are probably limited by the equipment that they have or the people that they have to, to throw practice. But if you can't, if you're in a position to be able to do that, it makes all the sense in the world. And it's, it's just, you know, getting the, getting the anxiety out of the way, getting them used to that level of performance. Like you said, if you're seeing 55 mile an hour pitching, and now all of a sudden you're seeing 75 mile an hour pitching one out of a hundred, you're going to quote unquote rise to the occasion. And, you know, you're going to get lucky and the, and the, the ball is going to find the bat. Right. And, and you could take it to any aspect of the game. Let's talk um, fielding. How many people take ground balls and then they just let the kid lob the ball over to first base? Well, with the machine we have, and this is part of the mental game again, quality practice with the machine we have, we shoot a ground ball and they have 4.3 seconds from the time the ball is shot out of the machine at home plate till the time that it has to reach first base. And we do the same. Yeah. So just little things. You don't need equipment to do that. You can have a stopwatch, a coach on a stopwatch, another parent on a stopwatch. Yeah. You know, 4.3 from the time the ball hits the bat till the time it's in first. So that way they have to learn the rhythm of the game. It puts a little pressure on them. All those things that really help you when, it's time to perform because you're going to have a guy running down 4.3. You're not going to have six seconds to stand up, make the play throw, you know, unless I'm running now, you know, right. <laughs> or, or me, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to your point, we'll, we'll do the same thing, but we'll believe it or not. We'll set, we'll set the, uh, we'll set the bar at four seconds. So my feeling is that we set it four seconds. We're making it a little bit harder than it's actually going to be for you. So that when it actually happens, it's that much easier. And that's perfect. I mean, that's, that's, you're making it more game. Like the more game, like you can make a practice, the better, the, the better they should perform in reality. Whereas if you make everything easy in baseball, like I said, batting practice to me is the most worthless thing, the way it's been done for the last hundred years. My dad, my dad and I used to have this discussion because he agreed with me on this and football doesn't practice their plays at half speed basketball. You don't practice your plays at half speed soccer. You don't practice baseball is the only one you do that. Yeah. Okay. Let's, yeah. let's work on this skill at half speed. What? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It is a trap that we all fall into. And I know, you know, and Dave, you've heard me say this many, many times. That's one of the things as a coach that I struggle with. I don't want to say struggle with, but I, but it's constantly uh, evolving is my ability to make my practices more game like. And it's it's not an easy thing to do. So you coaches out there don't don't think it's something that you're just going to pick up right away. It's very, very difficult. Yeah. So, so what can a coach do? Let's just use, you know, for practice again, we're talking quality practice. When you take batting practice, put a guy on second base, have teams, their job is to get the guy over and score. Whoever does the best, it, you know, they're the winner that day, whatever you want to say. Right. It, but yeah. So, so it's competitive because kids love to compete. They would rather compete than do drills every day of the week. So would I, so would anybody, right? but you got to have the drills to, to learn the basic movements of the sport, but then have them compete because that's what they're going to be doing in a game. And, and okay. it just takes a little bit of imagination. It doesn't take a lot of equipment. It takes a little bit of imagination, a little bit of forethought on how to do that. Right. Right. You have to, you have to just be creative because again, that's something that I've learned through the years is like you just said, use your imagination be creative and, and you'd be surprised what you can come up with. And, and, and a lot of times I find that it's actually the simpler things that work better. Don't try to overcomplicate it, make it simple, but be creative. Clemson baseball. I have a friend who's a volley at Clemson and when they take batting practice, they have their screen set a certain distance from home plate, the L yep. screen yep. and the target for the players is to hit the top of the L screen as they're hitting simple takes the only equipment it takes is the L screen. Right. Yeah. And it, it gives them something to shoot for. And so it's a quality practice as opposed to just a, Hey, we're going to blindly hit the ball. So something, something that you just said about, um, you know, gives you something to shoot for kind of leads me into a question that I wanted to ask you about, or I wanted you to talk a little bit about is goal setting. And, you know, how we can work with our players to teach them how to, you know, set process goals to get to their outcome goals. Yeah, so goal setting is huge. And um, now that the Olympics are on, I think it was a Canadian Olympic team. I read somewhere that uh, 99% of Canadian Olympians set goals. They go through the process of setting goals. And I got to imagine it's the same with the U.S. team. But that was the study that I read was 99% of the Canadians. Huge. Huge because a, it gives you guidance. It gives you something to shoot for. It gives you a roadmap if you do it correctly to get where you want to go. So one thing you can do is I went out and I bought, um, little notebooks, you know, about the size of a deck of cards. And I have the players first put in there why they play the game. Some kids being quite honest is that they put down there that I play because my parents make me. Other kids, hey, I play because I, I, you know, I love being with my buddies or I want to be in the MLB or whatever. But that's the first thing is understanding why your kids play the game. Because are you going to treat a kid who wants to play college baseball the same as a kid who's there because his parents make him? No, no way. No, no, absolutely not. And, and that doesn't mean you that you don't pay attention to the, to the one that he's there because his parents make him. Hopefully you pay more attention to him to hopefully gain a love of the game, but you got, you got to treat them differently. You don't treat everybody the same. So first figure out why they play the game and then what they love about the game, which can be two separate things. You know, they may just love the smell of the grass or, or whatever it is, or just making connection with bat with ball. So you understand that. And then you ask them, Hey, what's, what's your big goal? What's your long-term goal? And That's usually what's called an outcome goal or something that you have no control over being a draftee in the MLB, getting a college scholarship, whatever, you don't control that. Somebody makes that decision for you. And then from there you ask, what's this year's goal? What are you trying to do? And then you break it into four areas for this year's goal and you go, okay, what do you have to get better on physically? In other words, that's power, strength, speed, all those types of things, flexibility. What do you have to get better on technically? That may be, you know, fielding, form, batting, you know, going the other way, whatever it is. So you've got the physical and you've got the technical. You also have the tactical. 
what do you need to get better on tactically? Could be reading defenses when you're trying to bunt or, or whatever it is, uh, double, double cuts, whatever it is tactically that you have to improve upon. And then lastly is what do you need to improve on mentally? Right. I also ask them what they're really good at too, because that's just as important as what they're not good at. Cause we want to emphasize strengths. We don't want to de-emphasize strengths because we're also worried about confidence. We're not worried, but we want to make sure the kids maintain as much confidence as you can. And if you keep on saying, Hey, you, you need to work on this, 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 and this, because you're not there. Well, what's a kid going to think? Sure. I'm, good enough. I'm not good enough. Right. And, and everybody does something well. They just got to figure out what it is well. So anyway, we divide that into the four things. And let's say I need to get stronger. Okay. So what can you do to get stronger? Well, I can go to the gym. Okay. You can completely control that. So now we're talking a process goal. How many days a week do you need to go to the gym? Well, I need to go to the gym three days a week. Okay. What are you going to do at the gym for those three days? I need to do work on full body strength, whatever it is. So you just list it out. So you've taken it from their big goal. You've identified the four areas, that being the physical, the mental, the tactical, and the technical. Figure out what those things are that they need to work on and what they're strong at. And then you build a plan that they can control. Let's, t- let's talk physical eating. You know, you can control what you put in your mouth to some extent. You know, obviously little guys aren't going to be able to do that because mom and dad cook for them. Right. But an older kid, there's no reason they can't cook for themselves. And if they're serious about getting as best, you know, the, the most out of themselves as possible, then they got to start worrying about the sleep, the hydration, all that stuff. That's all, again, part of the mental game because it's all about performing. You put the right stuff in your body, your body will perform better. So I, right, I, did that kind of answer how you go down the, down the yeah. road there? Yeah. And, and I mean, I, I would argue that all of that, all of that adds back to um, reflects back on the mental game, because if you're going through and setting up that kind of plan and breaking it down into those basic steps, that's so much easier to, you're talking about eating, but I'll say mentally digest what you have to do to get to your end goal. Because if it's just, you know, all right, I, I, I need to throw five miles an hour faster that I have no idea how to do that. Well, here's how you could do it by changing your nutrition and then getting to the gym three times a week and working on these specific muscles when I'm at the gym and spending this much time on this exercise. And it, and as the smaller, this is something I go through in my everyday life with my, my training of, of my people at work it is when you, yeah, when you look at something as this whole giant thing it seems overwhelming but when you break it down it's the old the old saying you could eat a buick if you broke it down into small enough pieces and this is when you do that and you take that that's so much stress that you're taking off your own shoulders by doing that and it also relates back to something jimmy talks about all the time is with like preparing you know that your failure plan plan to fail type of thing yeah, and where do you get most of your confidence from in your preparation sure. it's not your performance that you've had in the past that helps but if you're prepared, you know, you're prepared, right? So you should have more confidence than if you are unprepared, you go into a test and you've studied, you're probably going to be a lot more confident than if you go into a test, just, Hey, yeah, I'd rather play Minecraft. Right. Or just guessing at a pattern of the, uh, the, the, um, yeah. <laughs> the, the random answers. All that gets into the mental game and, and, it, and it helps. It should help with confidence, but it also gives some, clarity and some control over something that may not be within that person's control. Everybody it's, let's say you want to play college baseball. You don't have control over that. What you do have control over is how hard you work, what you work on all those things. So you, it gives you a sense of control, which is really important, especially now we're talking nerves, which is what most people are really concerned about in the mental game. If you have a sense of control, you're going to feel more relaxed than if you don't have a sense of control, right? But getting back to goals, the three types of goals, right? You have outcome goals. You have no control over those at all. Those are great for long-term motivation. I want to be an MLB. I want to be in the MLB. Great for long-term motivation, right? But there's a downside to those those types of goals too. And that is you're probably, you could be, I shouldn't say probably, 
you could be setting yourself up for anxiety when you, I want to win the championship. Okay. Now you're in the championship game. That's been your goal all year long. You might have a little bit more anxiety if your goal was to, I want to play the best I can play something within your, you know, I want to have a hundred percent, hundred percent energy, hundred percent focus, whatever it is. So the outcome goals you have no control over. So they could induce anxiety over when you get close to get close to that ultimate goal. Then you have performance goals. Like you just talked about the add five miles an hour to my fastball. You kind of have control over that a little bit. I mean, there's some factors in there, genetic, whatever, that may not allow you to do that. But the way you get to that five mile an hour is through the process goals of I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to stretch. I'm going to do these drills. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do all those things that I can control. That's going to get me to that five mile an hour that will get me to the college that I want to go to. Does that make sense to y'all? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's like we talk about all the time. It's just, just having, having a plan and setting up to, to get there now, knowing what steps to do, that's the tough part. And that's where the research comes in and programs like yours can really, I mean, just help tremendously. And just, so we're, we're, Talking with Jonathan Reinbold, he is the mental performance coach. I am mentally strong.com. Encourage everybody to go out there and check it out. So after you finished with your coursework and where was the first place you were able to really apply your, uh, your, your skills? Actually, if you really want to know the truth, the first place I applied, it was with my kids before I even knew what I was doing. <laughs> and boy, was I a failure in some aspects of it. Well, I, I think, I think that's what we all go through from coaching, right? <laughs> right? We're, we're, our kids are always our guinea pig. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's no, there's no directions that come with them. That's why I love volunteers because they're doing the best they can with the knowledge that they have, you know, and they really ought to be applauded instead of, you know, shouted down or whatever. Some just need more education than others, but that's what I love about volunteers. They're doing the best they can with what they have. I, I worked with Merchant Marine Academy baseball team. And it's, they, they said, that's okay. That I say that you're really not supposed to say who you work with unless they release that. Right. But I've worked with high schoolers, baseball teams, individuals, baseball players, state champion, cross country runners, all American baseball player, division three baseball players, all region baseball players. So I've got a little bit of a background. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly a new neophyte at this. I'm not, you know, I'm not like Doc Zinzer, who I worked under, who's been doing the same thing for 40 years now, but the concepts are fairly simple. It's the art that you need to work on as, as a, you know, a mental performance coach, different techniques of teaching, et cetera. You left out one. You're right. One I did. Group. I left out the number one podcast host from <laughs> baseball. Well, I wasn't going to point it at myself, but I was going to say coaches. So you've worked with at least oh, yeah. one coach. <laughs> yes. No, I've worked with several coaches. Uh, I, I, yeah. No, I've, and actually when we're talking the mental game, that's the guys who should be teaching it. Yes. And it should be incorporated into their practices. That's why when I saw your post on the forum, I jumped on it right away because I, through whatever studying I had done, I knew that that was a part of, of my toolbox that was missing, that I knew I had to do it, but I didn't know how to do it. And one of the first things that you and I talked about was if you tell, you tell you guys, okay, guys, come on, let's do this. Now, guys, relax. Well, that's not teaching the mental side of the game. There's more to it than that. You have to teach them how to relax so that when you give them that cue, they know what to do. Correct. That's, uh, well, you know, that's, a, that's, that's another great teaching point right there. Okay. How you teach somebody and it doesn't matter what skill it is. How many times have you been on a baseball field and, and you see this at the youth level, especially, but I've seen it at college. Hey, keep your elbow up, do, do whatever. <laughs> so what you're doing is you're distracting the kid from trying to hit the ball, right? We want to give external cues when we teach somebody. Or when we're coaching them, we don't want to give them internal. But in the, when they're very, when they're first learning the skill, yeah, you know, you got your hands got to do this, your foot's got to do this, yes. But after they got the basic skills, then you got to start going with um, 
external cues. So if you want to hit, the, you want the guy to hit the ball the other way, you give him a target to say, Hey, try to hit the ball to the library or whatever it is in left center field or hit the inside of the baseball because their body will organize to do that. Right. Because the last thing you want to do in the middle of a game is distract a kid by telling him, Hey, keep your, the, fam- the famous one, keep your elbow up. Right. Right. Or right. <laughs> squish, you know, whatever it is. Or, but, or my, yeah. my favorite one is watch out for the curveball. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what, whatever it is, and, and again, well-meaning coaches just may not be educated yet. You know, it's, they're not dumb. It's just they haven't been educated. Um, yeah, so doing that, and, and it's the same thing with the mental skills. You can't tell somebody to relax. Right. Because what's the first thing they're going to think? Not relax. Relax. Yeah. relax. <laughs> I got to relax, right? That's not the way it right. works. So instead you give them a cue, take a breath, take a breath, step out, take a breath, find a focal point, which is another skill, find a focal point, take a breath, let them get themselves together right. and then go back at it. Yeah. yeah it, it's weird. It, it's weird that you'd say that that wouldn't work with the players. Cause it seems to work so well in relationships. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing that I, I find is, is more helpful than telling somebody, Hey, just relax. Yeah. I'm not well, uptight. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah. So so, no, somebody- I mean, it's, it's the same way with the mental game, you know, telling somebody to just relax is it's kind of like Mr. Coach obvious. Who is that? Who's the comedian, the baseball comedian? Um, I can't remember his name right now. So, I know uh, Adam Krola does a coach platitude routine that is, is similar to, I, I know what you're talking about and, and that's, that's not exactly him, but he does do a, a similar thing where it, 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 he'll do a, a five minute thing. On, and all it is, is just these empty state, <laughs> empty statements that, that, that come out. Yeah. Domingo um, Ayala. That's who it is. Mr. Coach obvious. It's like, Hey, throw a strike. Well, right. No kidding coach. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> that's another one of my pet peeves. Come yeah. on, just throw strikes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's what we what we just said about cues is again, because I've heard people talk about this. As a matter of fact, I think that uh Butch Chaffin mentioned something about this one when, when we had him on, was you know, like I'll yell out a cue from third base to the guy in the batter's box and I'll say focus. Okay. Well, it's a cue because I've already taught them what that means. So when I'm yelling focus, that's not, I'm just yelling focus. And I expect him to all of a sudden miraculously know how to focus. It's a cue to say, Hey, work. I, I need you to do right now. What we worked on for the last six months. I, I, absolutely. Uh, what, what's one of the biggest things a coach can do, especially at the youth level. It's teach them what they should be focused on and what they shouldn't be focused on. Right. I, I think I took you through the exercise. I, have two circles, a big circle yeah. on the outside and a small circle on the inside. And I label the outside circle drama. You know, language can be a little bit different depending, <laughs> on who, depending on who you work with. And then the inside is basically our target or what we should focus on. And there's very few things that you actually control that you should focus on. And that's your effort, your attitude, your presence. In other words, how you appear, your behaviors. And, you know, that. And your focus really, and that's about all that you can control. So if you, if you maintain your focus on those things, instead of, Hey, coach is yelling at me. My parents are in the stands. The umpire just home. made a crap call. Yeah. I've got a test tomorrow that I gotta, I gotta get yeah, home to study for exactly. all, the, all the rest exactly. of life. Exactly. You know, it's just understanding what you need to focus on and what isn't valuable to you it's again we focus on something all the time it's just is it going to help our game or is it going to hurt our game and teaching them what they need to focus on is really important that's the first step because if you don't know what you're supposed to focus on the game gets really hard real quick so one of the things that we talked about right at the beginning when you were talking about how you and jimmy came to meet and uh through the the website and he was one of the only people that even you know, responded to the, the request and whatnot. And we talk about like, is that a matter of, and I'm sure that it's a big part of it is people thinking this isn't important, but I'm, I would bet a big chunk of other coaches out there would be concerned about the time. 
So, uh, you know, I, I, I have, I have an hour and a half, three days a week to spend with my team. You know, I, I, we need to drill. We, we need to, we need to have an hour of, of 50 mile an hour batting practice, you know, in order to, to get ready. So how, uh, you know, how do you help to balance out how much time coaches should be spending with their players on doing this, these types of activities? I think most of it should be incorporated within the practice. If you can do it that way, for instance, batting practice. You go to a typical batting practice, especially at the youth level, you have one kid hitting and 99 kids standing around. <laughs> yep. Right. So the guy on deck could be doing box breathing. There's a great video. Um, Brian Kane. I don't know if you know who Brian Kane is, but Brian. I just, Kane saw, is, I just watched him at the convention. Yeah. He, he showed Notre Dame. The, they had their batting practice, four different stations besides the guy actually hitting. And it could be, Focusing, refocusing is one station. Breathing was another station. Going over your routine would be another station where they're just working on some aspect of the mental game. So there was nobody standing around doing nothing, you know, and, and you can do that. So quick thing, if guys, you know, we talked about breathing in the focal point. Well, if a kid's having a tough time in batting practice, he's going to get a lot more out of it. If you tell him, Hey, step out. Take a breath, find your focal point, get back in there. Because what happens is they just like, they keep, they try to brute force their way through it Ugh! and they keep on swinging and missing or fouling it off or whatever. And you just give them that space to be able to get themselves together, step back in and go at it. So that's another way you can incorporate it in, into the, and in taking ground balls, right? Somebody misses a ground ball. What, what happens usually? You just give them another ground ball, right? Well, maybe not best thing to do. Maybe have him take a ground, you know, he, he messes the ground ball up. Have him go through his process or his routine after he makes an error to bring him back to the present and then forget about him for five minutes or 10 minutes. Don't hit him any balls and then hit him another ball. What are we doing? We're replicating a game, right? And he's got to deal with that mistake that he made now for five or 10 minutes. Get it out of his mind and then go back again, takes no, takes no time away from practice. It's incorporated within the practice. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so two, two things to your point is when we're doing batting practice and like right now, obviously we're indoors. So we're in the cages and somebody's throwing every once in a while, um, the coach that's throwing the, the batting practice, I'll tell him to yell out to the batter two strikes. And at that point, the batter knows what he's supposed to do is one foot in the box, one foot out, pick your focal point, deep breath in, deep breath, um, you know, ex, uh, full exhale out, get back in, refocus and hit the pitch. So yep. we're, 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 it's part of batting practice. And then the other thing, what you just said is a failure station. As a matter of fact, we just worked on that today was uh, uh, same exact example that you used. We have a protocol that. When, when you miss the ball, okay, what you do is you'll right away, you know, give, give yourself a couple seconds, obviously, to clear your head because you're going to feel bad about doing it. But then there's a protocol that you have to do where you have to shout out to, let's say you're an infielder, you have to shout out the number of outs to the infield. Hey, guys, there's two outs. I'm back now. Let's go. That's it. And now you're ready to go again. So by my feeling, and correct me if I'm wrong, is by doing that, what we did is we just took their mind off of that error. And now we put their mind on what's the next thing that they have to do. Yeah, which is, is, which is, again, you can't play the last play. I, I, I do a little demo with three baseballs. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No, I, I basically stuck three baseballs together and I got this from Ken Revisa, who's like the granddaddy of all this stuff for baseball. Um, put the three baseballs together. So there's only one that you normally play with, right? How would you like to try to throw three baseballs or field three baseballs or hit three baseballs? Well, one represents the past, right? One represents the present and one represents the future. It's much easier to just play with one baseball than it is three baseballs. And that's right. kind of, it just gives a visual for, for what you, the point you're trying to get across. But yeah, incorporate how to, how to recover from failures into practice. Yeah. How many, how many guys practice what happens after you boot a baseball probably you know, nobody find, how, nobody does right 
Don't think right. that could be a valuable thing. Sure. You know, it's, it's, there's all these little things that you can do that again, take no time really. And take no money, take no, take no uh, equipment to be able to do to hone the game. Uh, uh, here's a great one. You have an inner squad, make a bad call. Not before you've taught them how to deal with it, right? You got to teach them how to deal with it first, but then make a bad call. And if they start, you know, complaining and all that, you realize, hey, he's playing the last pitch. I love that. You know, that make him reorganize himself, get himself back together, take the breath, step back on the rubber and go at it. Instead of, oh, that was, you know, that was, that was a strike. You know, I called it a ball. Sorry, too bad. Right. But you can't, you yeah. can't do that stuff. You can't do that stuff without teaching them how to deal with it first. Because all you're going to do is get a frustrated player. Right. Right. And, and we don't want frustrated players. We want practice to be fun. But I, but I like that because, again, it goes, goes to what you were saying before is how many people practice that. I, I can say I, I've never practiced that. I will preach to my players over and over that you can't control the umpire. So let's forget about it. Let's just play the game. But again, it's, it's, it's almost like that failure station where you need to have something. And like you said, in a squad, do it. And this way we could see how they react. And I love it. That's, uh, that's going in my notes now. Yeah. So the, the, the whole point of this whole discussion, I think is, is that you incorporate it into practice. It doesn't have to be, some of the initial stuff has to be standalone education, right? This is how you breathe. This is how you get rid of a mistake. This is a routine, all that stuff. But actually incorporating into your practice should take no time, no equipment, no effort. You know, I mean, it takes effort, but it doesn't take away from drills. It doesn't take away from practice time. It's incorporated as part of it. Right. Once, once you can teach the basic skills, then it's just, as you said, it, it, it doesn't, it, it's not a matter of, all right, we need 15 minutes when we're a month and a half in, we don't need 15 minutes of practice to do it. It's a matter of as things are going on during that session and dealing with them. Yeah. So there is one thing I'd like to try to get people to do and we warm up our bodies, but do we warm up our minds? Rarely. Yeah, good yeah. point. No. So one thing I've incorporated into our practices here is we do five minutes of meditation before practice starts. That was, that was my next topic, but go ahead. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Sorry. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So we do that and that's kind of a mental warm up, or we might talk about a skill for five minutes or do progressive muscle relaxation or something like that for five minutes before practice, you know, mentally warmed up. And also it's a transition from school to baseball. Yeah, I, I definitely, again, because of you, that's been a, a, a staple of my practice ever since you taught me what to do with it. And, you know, you'll come to the, come to the field. And one of the first things you'll do is you'll see my guys scattered all over the place, laying on their back eyes closed in a relaxed state and just meditating. Yeah. It's, and, and people that, you know, I, I didn't know what it was before I actually started doing it. And I thought it was like, you know, sit cross-legged um, incense and right. you know, <laughs> kumbaya. It's, yeah. It's not, it's none of that. So if I, if I could take you through a, like a one minute or just a condensed version, this is what it would be. It would be, okay. Take a couple deep breaths in through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, now close your eyes on this last one. Boom, you've done that. Now let's just feel your body against the ground. Feel that sensation of where your sit bones are or where your hands are on your lap or whatever. Okay, after you do that for a little bit, then you go, okay, just take in the sounds. What sounds do you hear? You know, just let them come in and go out. Boom. If you get distracted, just come back to what you're doing. And then you go, okay, start scanning your body. Just feel how your body feels today. What areas are tight? What areas are loose? You know, are, do you feel heavy today? Do you feel light? That kind of stuff. And then after you do that, you just go into, just pay attention to your breath. You know, breathe in, breathe out, count your breaths, stay focused on that. And you're going to, you're going to lose your focus. You're going to go off to whatever you're thinking about. You come back to it. You come back to your breath, not beating yourself up. Just come back to your breath. And then you go, but you know, and that 
almost is the end of it. Then you go back to you feeling your sit bones and then listening again to the noises and then basically you're done. So there's nothing weird. I'm weird about it, if you will, or it's, it's, you know, it's not conventional Western. So everybody thinks it's a little weird, but what you're doing is you're teaching your brain how to, when it loses focus, come back to what you want to focus on. Think that's a skill you could use in sports <laughs> every day. So. Is that so. a skill you can use in life? <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. You know, and it's and the other, the other effect it has is it has the effect of relaxing you too. And you, most, most baseball players cannot play tense. You've got to play relaxed and your muscles. Be loose. I mean, that's just the way it works is you yep. play best when you're, when you're relaxed, you know, not, not like, falling asleep relax but you're focused but your body is not rigid tight you know you're not carrying your shoulders up in your ears or whatever wherever you carry your tension so doing five minutes of that or progressive muscle relaxation or just talking about a skill just and then having them practice the skill box breathing for five minutes five minutes you can't find yeah. five minutes to do that to help your players and the thing is is that this is what i love we talked about it earlier you're not helping them with baseball necessarily. You're helping them with life. Right. You know, with life. Just right. think about that for a second. That's which one's a little more important. It's definitely the life part. <laughs> yeah. You know, stuff you teach them, they could be with them for the rest of their lives. You know, they're, they're done hitting a curveball probably when they're most kids, 18, some lucky ones get to go to 22. Right. And the real lucky ones get to go to 39, 40. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah. it, it, it's it's funny with, with the meditation because I was reluctant to implement it into my practice because I kind of felt, I'll be honest, I felt funny doing it. But I I, I was I, I felt funny doing it. And I also felt like the kids would not buy into it. Yeah, I remember because the kids that, that I'm coaching are, you know, 13, 14, 15, 16 in that range that I was afraid they wouldn't buy into it. But I'll tell Every single coach out there that is listening to this, I, I couldn't be more wrong. They, the, the boys buy into it. They, I don't have to say a word. It's part of our practice. They know it. They go out, they do it. And it's something that, you know, if, if you don't try it, you'll never know, but it works. Yeah. It's, and, and you're not going to get hundred percent of your kids. My, my motto or mantra or not really motto, but the way I look at it is if I'm working with a team and I help one person, that's right. a success. That's right. I've succeeded. If I can help 20, that's awesome. But if I help one person, I've helped one person, right? Some kids will obviously buy in. Some will not buy in. But if nothing else, you're giving them 10 minutes to just chill or five minutes to just chill. And how many kids get a chance to do that? Because they're coming from school. They've got school. They've got big thing in their life called their social life. Right. They've got parents, they've got the sport, they've got all that stuff. I mean, it's tough to be a kid, right? And you're sure. giving them five, 10 minutes just to chill. And whether and they like it or not, they're going to reap the benefits of it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, that's, I, I, I and it, the studies are out there showing the benefits of meditation how it actually physically changes your brain for for the betterment and i i use myself in this example and my wife will either scoff at this or say it's true as i used to be kind of an angry guy and i've chilled a lot more since i've been doing this now whether that's because of meditation or just because i'm getting old i'm not sure but it, I, I think it honestly it honestly has i can handle stuff a lot better now than i could before Oh, I would think I would think it has more to do with the meditation because I yeah. know as Be careful as I get what's better that? not say age. You better not <laughs> no, say no, no, age. No, 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 no. I was just gonna say I'm I'm talking <laughs> strictly for myself. I know the older I get, the crankier I'm getting. <laughs> so <laughs> it's got to be the meditation. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's uh, it's something I truly believe in, and and it's something that I practice every day. And we have the players do that warm up, that mental warm up. And that's so what, what usually what, what, what would be an, what would be an ideal amount of time to like in the morning, you know, you'd, and would it be right before practice or in the morning or like what what's what's a good plan? I like doing it at practice at the start of practice for two reasons. 
One is you ensure they do it, right? Two is it gives that break between school and baseball. It, it delineates the two, right? It's not you just run from one to the other. Now we've got that five minutes where we're just chilling. If you just want to chill or you're doing your meditation and it allows you to, to transition. So, so that's great to try to incorporate or not try to actually incorporate it in the beginning of, of a practice um, baseball season. Well, nowadays baseball season is 11 and a half months out of the year for some kids, but for some kids, it's still three months. So beyond the baseball season, which we've been talking about this whole time, how these are really life skills. Let's talk about how we, as, as parents, the most important voices in our kids' head, how can, how can we help to start to incorporate this with our kids? Well, I mean, you could do meditation as a family. That's one thing you could do, which I think would be awesome, but there's, there's other things you can do. You can teach them some of those skills yourself, but how you raise your kids is also important. And I'm not trying to tell people how to raise their kids. That's not what I'm getting at. It's just some of the things that you say can have an effect, positive or negative, on your on your kids. And, now, and I'm guilty of this one. I had two collegiate athletes in my family, my daughter and my son. And I think they both suffered a little bit from performance anxiety because of the way I talked to them when they were kids. I told them how good they did you know, all the outcome stuff. Hey, you did great. You, you know, went three for four, or you, you know, you, you won the meet or what, whatever it was. And studies have found that that actually can work against a kid um, mentally, because what it does is it tends to make them ego involved, if you will, instead of task involved. So as they get older, if we praise the outcomes, hey, you did a great job today. You did a great job today. You did, you know, you were three for four or whatever. They want that praise from the parent. Um, every kid wants to, their parents, you know, praise. And what happens is, is now when they get into a stressful situation later on, they try to, they may try to just kind of avoid that situation. They're not going to do things that could expose them as not being smart, not being a great athlete or whatever. So they don't progress. And I think that's part why you see a lot of kids that are really good when they're young and then they get into high school and they're just average because they never work because they were praised on how well they did instead of being praised for things that they do control, like their effort and their attitude and all those things. So when Johnny does a great job on the baseball field, say he gets a hit instead of saying, Hey, you know, you did a great job hitting the ball today. You could say something like, Hey, you really focused up today. You know, so you're not, you're not rewarding them for something that they ultimately don't control whether they get a hit or not. Is their kid standing there? Or is their kid not standing there? Instead, you're focusing, them, you're focusing on their effort, their attitude, and praising those type of things. Hey, you know, when things didn't go well today, you stood out there and looked confident. You know, one kid that I coached who was an All-American pitcher, uh, did the mental stuff with. You could not tell if he was getting shelled or if he was striking everybody out because he was just, his presence was just, I mean, he was a rock, right? So that's the kind of stuff you need to praise. If a kid gets good grades, you don't say, hey, you got, you know, you're really smart. They may be really smart. What you need to say, you need to say stuff like, hey, you put in a lot of effort to get that grade. So now when they want your praise, if you're praising their effort, their attitude and all that, they're willing to take the risks of failing because you're not praising the outcome. You're praising the work involved to get the outcome. The effort. Yeah, the effort, the attitude, you know, hey, you studied really hard for that test. Yeah, one, one of the things that I've been seeing a lot lately is what people out there are saying to, that parents should be doing is a very simple thing. You get in a car, you're on the way home, regardless of if he went 0 for 4 or he went 3 for 4 that day, just turn around, just look at your kid and just say, hey, you know something? I really love watching you play. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's huge. Takes pressure off the kid. Yeah. First of all, 
Yeah. Second of all, it allows them, if they want to talk about their performance, they can talk about their performance. If they don't want to, they don't. It's just kind of, you know, and, and I, again, I was not a perfect parent by any stretch of the imagination. But when I started doing that, I think my relationship with my son and my daughter just, it, it got better. Right. Because it took that tension away. Yeah. And, and allowed, and I actually got to coach my son in college, right? So he'd get on first base and I'd say, hey, you know, I just love watching you play. He'd strike out and I'd be, hey, I just love to watch you play, dude. Just keep having yeah. fun. And he, he ended up playing really, really well in college. But earlier in his life, I didn't do that, right? And I think our relationship got stronger when I started to do that. And he, I think it, it helped him enjoy this, again, enjoy the sport more. Yeah. So, and it's hard being a parent. It's hard being a coach because there's no, there's no manual for it. There's no if A, then B, because everybody's different. You know, it's, it's tough and we don't know. Absolutely. You don't know what you don't know. Well, there's, there's so much more that's out there and that's available now. People like yourself that are working on this side of the game that I never heard of when I was coaching my, uh, my kids are 18 and 21 now. So it's been a number of years since I've coached them and uh, you're making me feel really bad about some of the things that I did. And said <laughs> well, you them shouldn't, you did the best. They... You... No, wait, wait a second. You did the best that you could do with what you knew. Right. All right. So yeah. how can you, how can you fault yourself? I mean, I, I went through the same thing and then I realized, right, Hey, right, right. I did what I knew the best. I, I didn't try to do anything. Yeah. I just hear a little cats in the cradle playing in the back in the background <laughs> right now. Like a little tearing up going on. <laughs> no, you know, here, here's the thing. The other thing you can do as a parent read, get, there's yes. a great book heads up baseball Two, by Ken Revisa, the late Ken Revisa. Heads up baseball too is a great mental performance game, but there's so many out there, you know, uh, Jim Aframau. I'm just now, I'm now reading a book from Nate Zinzer about confidence that he just published in, uh, this past, past week, I think. So I'm in the process of reading that one, but there's so many good books out there that guys could read and you can learn a lot. You know, you can go to get formal education and get your master's or you can just read like crazy and probably get just about the same amount of information minus the art piece of it. Right. I think that that, that applies to, you know, coaches. I would, I I won't say more so than parents, but just as important coaches, you have to read. You have to, I know you've heard me say it on this show a million times. I, my studying is ongoing and it's constant yeah to me that brings up another point about being a coach um one way we learn is through watching others right and part of leadership too is doing the things that we expect others to do we expect our players to be in the books that's right to get better why aren't we in the books to get better the, the, the one that this is a personal thing of me is the, the coach who's out of shape, who yells at his players, you know, that they're not in shape, right? Kind of setting a bad example, you know, can't be the same, you know, I can't at 58 years old, I can't be this in the same level of shape that I was in high school, but I can, I can do put a little effort in, you know, if you expect your players to put some effort in, then you need to put some effort in. Otherwise yeah. you're just, you're, you're not being genuine. Yeah. I'm, I'm not running wind sprints with the guys, no. but, but no. I, but I, but I am jogging. If I'm going out to the outfield to hit in outfield balls, I'm jogging, I'm grabbing my bat. I'm jogging out there. I'm, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not winded when I get out there. And, and so let's take it to the mental game. You want your players to be relaxed and focused and the umpire makes a bad call. How are you reacting? Right. Because your players will take a cue from you on how you're acting. So if you're yelling at the umpire, you're going crazy, guess what they're going to do? They're, they're going to mimic. Exact, exact gonna same the thing. exact same yeah. thing, right? And, and, and to tell you, to your point, with umpires specifically, I find that I have to 
go to my parents to tell them relax, you know, when, when the umpire makes a bad call, because I don't, I don't get upset. I take it easy, but the parents going crazy has the same effect on the player as, as if I was going crazy because they, they they're going to get all amped up now because of the way the parents are reacting. So I, I will school my parents that listen, they're umpiring in our travel game for a reason because they're not that good. Otherwise they would be yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. It's well, you know, I did this with a basketball team once I made signs and one of the signs I did was breathe. So during the middle of the game, like at the, you know, a free throw or whatever, I'd hold up the sign. If it was a pressure situation, I'd just say, breathe. Maybe yeah. you ought to hold up signs to your parents because they don't know how to relax. Teach them how to relax. There you go. <laughs> I'll have all my parents meditating before the game. There you go. Hey, that would be awesome. If you could that get that awesome. to work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, no, just I, mean, might tr- I, I just might try that. <laughs> but the modeling is so important as a coach. You know, if you want them to do it, you got to do it yourself. Absolutely. If I, I, you know, I, that's actually how I got my first team to actually start meditating is through modeling. I went out in the left field. We're on Oahu and I go out in left field by myself and I take my, I, I used Headspace at the time, which is just an app you can put on your phone. It teaches you how to meditate. Calm does the same thing, I think, but I use Headspace. But anyway, I uh, go out in left field and they just see me sitting there you know, doing nothing. And they're like, coach, what are you doing? I'm meditating. You know, after, after I got done, cause I was doing five minutes of it. So they're like, what is going on here? And then I explained the benefits of it and all that. And they're like, uh, so they, a couple of them started sitting in right. doing it with me and voila, they, they you started go. buying in because I was showing that I was doing it. It was something I was doing. Right as opposed to something I'm telling them that they have to do while I don't do it. Hey, you need to eat right. You better eat right, coach. You know, you better not be drinking. Even if you don't eat right, you better not be drinking sodas and and eating, you know, moon pies or something in front of the kids. Right. Right. You know, it's, it's just modeling and that, and then they'll pick up on it. The kids aren't, kids aren't dumb. They'll pick up on it. That was Brilliant. the old uh, bad news bears, buttermaker, you know, pounding beers in the dog. Yeah, house, yeah absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So yeah. yeah, that's, that, that would be a thing I would say to the coaches and you don't have to be perfect because everybody's the thing too, that people need to understand is doing the mental game. Doesn't mean you're without emotion. You're going to get right. mad. You know, it's just, can you control it or does it control you? Right. So yeah, you're going to get mad that the umpire made a bad call, but okay. Can now I get over it and come back and be focused? And if I get mad, do I act out? That's probably not the best, you know, best thing to do. You don't go right. covering home plate with dirt like Earl Weaver. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> I guess I'm showing my age there, aren't I? I was just going to say a lot of people know who Earl Weaver is. Know who Earl Weaver is. <laughs> yeah. So. It's, but you, you also don't want to be Dusty Baker falling asleep in the dugout. No. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know, who was it? Connie another Mack used to do reference. that. Yeah. yeah. Or Casey Stengel or Connie Mack used to do that. One of those two. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, no, you you don't want to do that, but you just gotta you gotta embrace the skills that you're teaching, and then try them yourself. Because if you're relaxed, chances are your players are going to be more relaxed. If you're in the bottom of the ninth or the bottom of the seventh or tenth or whatever, and it's a pressure situation, and you go to you guys, man, this is fun. Right. Are they going to likely go? You know what? If you can have fun, why can't I have fun? And it right. gets back and that gets back to why they play. Okay. So taking this discussion all, all the way back to full circle, if the kid understands why he plays when a pressure situation comes, I play because I like to compete. Well, guess what, dude, you're doing what you love to do. Or I play yeah. because I like to be with my buddies. Guess what? You're doing what you like to do. Who cares what the outcome is? Right. Focus on what you want to do Uh-oh. and let it happen. And if the outcome is great, that's, 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 that's a bonus on the cake. Right. Yeah. Yep. Like I said, it, the, the kids, when they do this and they buy in and they start doing these things almost to a kid. And I haven't asked everybody, I shouldn't say kid, almost to a player. 
they enjoy their sport more. They have more fun. Isn't that ultimately, especially at the youth level, what we should be doing? Preach it all the time, right, Dave? Yeah, we talk about it all the time. At the end of the day, we're talking about youth sports. It has to be fun. And in order for it to be fun, they have to be prepared. They have to go and incorporating a lot of this, what we've talked about here today. And again, we're on with Jonathan Reinbold. Check him out at IamMentallyStrong.com. That's where his business ri- uh, resides. And uh, you know, if you can incorporate even not all of this, but so much, uh, a lot of this of what we talked about in, you're going to find out the kids are going to have more fun. The parents are going to have more fun. The coaches are going to have more fun. And we're going to get to grow the sport and, and keep the kids involved and keep them, keep them interested. Yeah. I, the, you hit it on the, you hit the nail on the head when you talk coaches too, because I was one of those guys, you got to win, got to win, got to win, got to win, got to win. And I was <laughs> brutal. I was brutal. And now it's, I'm worried about developing skills. Okay. Part of that was when I lived in Japan. The, the kids there, the way they teach baseball and the way they play baseball, it's not about winning or losing. It's literally about how well you play. You know, did you get a good effort? It's, it's all those things that we, you know, it's a different Eastern, it's more of an Eastern mentality than the Western mentality. And the funny thing is, is when you do that, what happens? You give yourself a better chance to win. To win. Sure. Which sure. is kind of weird. It's like you focus on the win. You give, yeah, you know, John Wooden, right? Everybody knows John Wooden or, some people may not know who John Wooden was. I think he won, what, 11 national basket or national yeah, titles like, and ins- some unreal number and consecutive years. He had like five years or something without losing a game. Yeah. And he never once, to his players, never once mentioned the word win. Right. He just mentioned processes and, you know, like, hey, instead of saying, hey, we need to get more more rebounds you would talk about get yourself in a position to block out to give us the opportunity to get more rebounds right right he focused all on process stuff it's all in the process yep yep all right well i I think that's a great place to wrap this up again on with jonathan reinbold um so you will do sessions with individual teams and things like that over uh, yeah absolutely i can do and all teams individually coaches coaches and teams Right. And you know what? And my prices are are way below what they probably should be. And and I don't say that to try to get more business because I must, I suck as a being a businessman (laughs) right now. I've got a lot, I got so much to learn, but to me, it's more important that these skills get out to the players. Right. And it is, I'm I'm retired. I'm retired military guy. So I don't need the money. It's more, Mm -hmm. I do this because I love it and I love helping kids and helping people out. So. And it's it's giving back. Yeah, pretty much. And I, if, as long as I can cover my cost of my, you know, technical year that I have to be able to do this, that that's perfect for me. Right. All right. Well, that's awesome. I, I, I really, I cannot thank you enough. So much of what we talked about today is twofold. One, learning some, some new things. And then two, also reinforcing some of the things that we talk about on here all the time. Uh, it's, it's been, it's just been a pleasure. I really appreciate you coming on here today, Jonathan, and, uh, hopefully we can, we can drum up some more business for you. Uh, you know, it's funny when you, when you, and not for the business end, but we'll, we'll get some more people in that you can help. Yeah. Even if they, you know, what I do is, uh, Facebook, it's free. doesn't cost you anything. I don't charge anything and I put content out there. So if I also kind of try to double it on my website. So you can just grab some things there. I mean, it's, it's free. Mm-hmm. And a lot of this stuff, like I said, if you just read, you, you can get a lot of this stuff on your own. Sure. But if you need guidance, I can, I can provide that guidance or help. It's nice to have it. Yeah. It's nice to have it all in, in kind of one, one spot that people can go to and at least as a starting point with it. And then they can decide on what they, you know, there's pick up a few things here, or there. Again, we talk about it all the time. We talk about coaching the coaches and expanding. Don't be set in your ways that I know what I've, I've been doing this for 20 years. I know what I'm doing. It works. Blah, blah. It doesn't work as well as it could. So always should always be open to learning new things. Yeah. Because I've learned as, as I get older, the more stupid I really am. <laughs> or you were. Yeah. <laughs> you were. Perfect. Yeah. The more, the more, the older I get, the more I realize what I don't know. I, yeah. I just want to say that uh, for you people out there, Jonathan's Facebook group is called the baseball mental game. So on Facebook, look for that, join his group, 
there's going to be a lot of stuff there. He's put stuff out there already that's good stuff. So let's keep working on the mental game. It's a very, very important part of what we do. Yeah, with that, again, thank you for spending your time. I know your time is valuable out there. Jonathan, I'm, I'm sure there might be one or two things you'd rather be doing out in uh, Hawaii than talking to us, uh, you know, uh, cranky coaches here, but we appreciate you spending the time. This has been great. And um, I'm, I'm sure we'd love to have you back again at some point. Yeah, I had fun. I, I enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. And uh, no, I actually, I'd rather do this than uh, go out and install my sprinkler system today. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, also, I'm just going to echo what Dave said. Thank you for coming on the show. But also, thank you so much for everything that you've done for me in giving me the tools to help my players get better. And it's what you've done for me is priceless. And I owe you a great uh, debt of gratitude. Well, I, th I, thank, I thank you for helping me hone my skills. It works both <laughs> ways, man. All right. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up our this week's show for the clearing the bases podcast i want to thank everybody for tuning in and listening uh as always write to us you can get us at the ctb show on twitter you can reach us at clearing the bases at gmail.com go ahead and drop us a line let us know what you thought of the show uh review the show on your uh, apple podcasts or spotify or wherever you listen to the show Go ahead and give us the five-star review. Really appreciate uh, you pushing us up the charts. Our listenership has been growing every session, and we want it to keep going. We want to make the best show we can for you guys, bring you great information, and, and you know take some, some different directions like we did today. I think that this is hugely beneficial to anybody that's listening to this. So uh, with that, always remember the only two things in life that we can control at all times are our effort and our attitude. Give me 100% effort, positive mental attitude, PMA. And great things will follow. Final thoughts, coach? Well, everybody knows that the mental part of the game is, is a very, very important aspect of coaching that I value greatly. And I think this, th this show was a great show to prove that point. And with a little bit of effort on your part as a coach, a little bit of studying, it really doesn't take much. You can learn how to do these things and how to make your players better. So put that in your toolbox, you know, along with the X's and O's of the game, the mental part has to be taught. And I'll leave you like I always do. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one.